Lanka and I are originally from Delft. And to get from Delft to here, we had to travel for eight hours. First, we had to go to the train station, be for the, in the train for an hour, almost missed our flight, actually. Normally, you would have to wait for hours on the airport. Then we had to fly for three hours, which was okay. Then we arrived at the airport in Athens and still had to drive one hour to get to the city center. Eight hours of travel, of which only three were actually effective. This is still quite good if you compare it to 100 years ago. 100 years ago, it would take you around 30 hours to get from Delft to Athens. And 200 years ago, it would not even be possible to get from our city to yours in a somewhat comfortable manner. We live in a world where society is demanding more and more for every individual. I think that the most demanding thing is being connected. And not only digitally, like you can call people, video call, maybe in the future even make use of Hyperloop, uh, of, of holograms, but um, physically, being physically connected is even more important. But we can see that actually being physically connected, getting from A to B, is getting harder and harder. Roads are very often congested, as you can see here. Whenever you want to board a plane, you have to wait hours before you can actually get in. And when you travel by train, if, during peak hours, you're lucky if you get a comfortable standing position. This shows that we actually have to do something about the current infrastructure that we're in. Not only about making uh, traffics or making roads wider, but also by coming up with new concept that could be the future of transportation. What we're going to talk about started in 2013 when Elon Musk wrote a white paper about the Hyperloop. He did some calculating, he did some thinking, and actually really sparked the interest of many people. And this is why Hyperloop is eventually maybe becoming the most interesting topic of innovation in the transportation industry. The Hyperloop makes use of pressurized capsules that have passengers or cargo in them and that can travel at extremely high speeds. Our, uh, our Hyperloop can reach speed of up to 1,080 kilometers an hour. It does this by, have, by traveling in vacuum tubes. And the vacuum tubes ensure that there is little to no aerodynamic drag. This, in combination with the magnets that it used to levitate, ensure that very little energy is ne needed to get from A to B. This way, we can go from Amsterdam to Paris in a little under 30 minutes. This makes it way faster than the train and the car, but also than the plane, because the tubes are relatively small you can get from city center to city center. If you compare the energy consumption of the Hyperloop to that of a train, a maglev, a car, and an airplane, you can see that it clearly beats the latter three. However, if you compare it to the train, there's quite some room for improvement. If you look at the cruising speed of the various forms of transportation, you can see that Hyperloop is the clear winner when it comes to efficient passenger transport. So you must be wondering, if there are so many advantages to Hyperloop, why is it not here yet? Well, that is because there are quite some challenges when it comes to developing new technology, especially if this has a huge impact on society. And these challenges, they include, of course, technology, uh, which you are probably familiar with as people, uh, as people with a technical background. And in terms of technical aspects, we need to think of the design of the vehicle, also called the Hyperloop pod, but also things like the tubes and the station, and last but not least, the infrastructure. And all of this we need to think for, for future scenarios. So today, I would like to walk you through all the topics uh, revolving around the Hyperloop Enigma. So let's get on board and start talking about what's probably most relevant for you as the future Hyperloop passenger. What will the Hyperloop passenger pod be like? 
The vehicle design is extremely important since it is what for a large part determines the safety of the system since it has a direct interface with the passenger. So I would like to present to you the Hyperloop passenger pod. It is 30 meters in length and it seats 50 passengers to accommodate for a future passenger demand. And the first thing you probably already noticed is that it has a very aerodynamic look. And then a question may pop up. Why do we design for aerodynamics when Rineke just told us that Hyperloop operates in a vacuum? It doesn't make sense, right? Well, that is because Hyperloop does not operate in a hard vacuum, but it operates in a soft vacuum, meaning that there's still a little bit of air particles inside the tube. And this air causes drag, aerodynamic drag, which reduces the speed of your vehicle. And for that reason, it is still very important to design for this aerodynamics and to get the most out of your vehicle. A characteristic that is probably more remarkable about our design is the fact that compared to current unidirectional hyperloop designs, meaning that they have a clear nose and tail and travel in a single direction like an airplane, our design is bidirectional. And the reason we chose for this symmetrical design is because it allows for, first of all, easier vehicle maneuver, but also for a lot of cost savings in terms of station design. So let me put it this way. Imagine if trains could only travel in a single direction. How inconvenient would that be? And this is also the exact reason why airplanes, for example, take a lot of space, resulting in huge, literally huge airports. And for Hyperloop, we could simply avoid this problem by going for the bi-directional design. So if we look at Hyperloop from a full-scale scenario, you can see that the pod has diameter of 2.7 meters. The tube is slightly bigger, 3.5 meters, to allow for efficient airflow. And both tubes together, one for getting to your destination and one for getting back, take up as much space as a two-lane highway. The tubes of the Hyperloop are 2.5 centimeters thick two and a half centimeters of steel. And this way we ensure that the tubes are safe and that they can withstand buckling from the huge uh, pressure differences as well as from external factors such as different types of weather and climate. If you look at the operating pressure of Hyperloop, you can see that it operates roughly between 30 to 200 pascals. And as you can see, this is a range. So instead of operating in a fixed pressure, Hyperloop operates in a variable soft pressure. And this implies that you can adjust the air pressure according to your travel demand. So for example, if the travel demand is very high, which happens during peak hours, then you would lower the air pressure in the tubes. Whereas if fewer policy to travel, increasing the pressure would be more efficient. And this way, uh, using this variable soft vacuum principle, we can ultimately reduce the total amount of energy we use, making Hyperloop a very flexible and efficient mode of transportation. We're living in an era where safety is one of the most vital aspects of innovation. And apart from the system being safe, it is also extremely important that the passenger feels safe. People are often scared of unfamiliarity. In the past, we thought that traveling at speeds higher than 30 kilometers an hour would kill you because your heads would explode. And that is why for every technical innovation, it is extremely important that we show that it serves the human. And this is true for Hyperloop as well. And that is why we decided that it was also very important to design and research for this passenger experience. And then you ask yourselves questions like, what makes a vehicle a vehicle that people are willing to travel in? Maybe more relevant for now, what makes a successful Hyperloop vehicle that can be accepted by society? And we combined the answers to these questions and we translated them into an interior design. As you can see, it looks very spacious due to the use of light colors. The seats, they look very comfortable and safe. The screens in the back, they show real-time information on travel status. And alternatively, 
they could be used to display landscapes, for example. And if the passengers wish to have more social interactions, they could also use these screens to display photographs or videos. The options are endless. One of the more special features is the sky pedal. So the sky pedal um, is a screen that mimics the light of day. And um, the color of this pedal changes according to the time of the day and the time zone that the passenger is in. And this way, the passengers can get a sense of their whereabouts as well as what's happening in the outside world, ultimately making the Hyperloop experience more comfortable and pleasant. So where you can embark on the Hyperloop pod, there must be a station. The Hyperloop station uses a turn up and go system. This means that um, as a passenger, you arrive at the station, you go to your pod and you embark on one. And when all passengers have embarked, the, the pod closes and travels to an airlock. And this airlock is a chamber that is situated in between the two states of pressure. And in this chamber, the pod is brought from a normal atmospheric pressure to a low tube pressure. And when it has reached that state, it can enter the vacuum tube and travel to its destination. So I've now given you an idea of the vehicle as well as the tubes and the station. But where would we implement Hyperloop? And how do we facilitate the framework that is needed for this mode of transportation? We do that using this network. Yeah. This is the European Hyperloop network. It connects all frequently visited European cities from capitals to economic hearts to your favorite vacation destination. And with Hyperloop, we could eliminate short to medium haul flights and thereby reduce air pollution. And with this network alone, we could already do so for two thirds of the air traffic between these cities. This makes Hyperloop very special. And with this network, we could change lives and make one and take one step into a more sustainable future. As students from a technical university, we are not in the illusion that we can change the entire world by just thinking of a concept like this. However, we do really see that it is necessary to actually think about innovative concepts like the Hyperloop or other forms of transportation. To raise awareness, our team is competing in the SpaceX Hyperloop pod competition. This is a competition organized by SpaceX and they challenge student teams from all around the world to come up with a concept that could be Hyperloop. Our goal for this year is to build a prototype that goes as fast as possible in a low pressure tube of one kilometer long. This basically boils down to 40 students sitting in an office day and night designing, building and testing their vehicle. In fact, we're assembling the pod as we speak. Like Lanka already said, we're also performing research regarding the Hyperloop. And we've already come up with quite some interesting concepts and topics that are covered, but there are still quite some challenges open. And one of the big challenges that we at least face in Europe is that we're working with many different countries. This implies, for instance, legislation. We in the Netherlands have different legislation regarding infrastructure than you do here in Greece. And somehow, we must make one system that complies to all of these different legislations. Another thing that you encounter when you travel large distances over a certain infrastructure is that you encounter different soil types. In Delft, we build everything on clay, whereas if you want to go somewhere else, you might encounter sand or rock. And this is all things that we need to take into account. Furthermore, one of the largest challenges is that we're designing for the future. We are designing with the materials that we know now and the properties that we know now, but maybe 20 years from now, these properties have changed and we could opt for different materials. This is the same for predicting travel flows. What if passengers that want to go to a certain vacation destination don't want to do that anymore in 20 years? This raises a lot of challenges, but we do believe that we can tackle these challenges and that if we work together, we can actually come up with a Hyperloop system 
that could work. So in this way, we would also like to stimulate you guys to think about ways that we could move from A to B in the future. And maybe together, we could create a world where transportation with a Hyperloop is a standard. Thank you.